let's start with a question. Why is there a difference in wealth among societies? Why are Caribbean and African societies poorer than European societies? Well, the answer is choice. It is the choice that people make in societies that lead to either wealth or poverty. Some societies, people take risk, look towards the future, and collaborate. Other societies, they don't. But why is the difference? Well, the difference comes from stories. Stories tell people who they are, what they can do, but also what they can't do. Now, there's one story that seems to link the developing world. It's the story of color, whereby colored people can't, and white people can. I'm going to take you tonight on a journey to show how stories shape choices, but also how to change those choices. Now, to understand stories, we need to understand us and our goal, which is survival. Now, to survive, we need one thing. We need control of our environment. In order to get control, we have two movements. We either approach opportunity or avoid threat. Now, for millions of years, our ancestors walked around approaching others, thumping them on the head, and others avoided being thumped on the head. Now, gradually, we figured out that approaching others to gain their protection was also handy for our survival. But in order to get protection, we needed to have something of value to give to the group. So, we needed to be able to cook, or fish, or hunt. If we didn't have a skill, we would be pushed out of the group. Now, to avoid us being pushed out of the group, we evolved an emotion, an emotion called self-esteem. You may recognize this emotion when, for example, somebody tells you, you're dumb, you're stupid, or you're ugly, and you feel that emotion go through your body. It's that emotion to avoid being excluded from your group. Now, the more we collaborated, the more something happened in our brains. Our emotions changed into something else called thought. Now, approaching opportunity got translated into, I can. Avoiding threat, I can't. With thought, we also got something else. We were able to label the world so we could better predict that world, so we could control that world. But along the way, we also came up with stories. You are bad because you come from there. You are good because you come from here. And we are here, all of us, because of gods. Now, the more we started to collaborate, something else was needed, leadership. Leaders needed to coordinate us. Now, with leadership comes hierarchy. Normally, in the animal kingdom, hierarchy is gained through force, thumping other animals on the head. But we had something else. We had stories. I am a leader because gods put me here and put you down there. But not only the stories of gods shaped hierarchy, also the stories of gender, males more important than females. The story of wealth, that my wallet is bigger than yours. And the stories of beauty. Now, one story came to shape society, which was the story of color. To understand that, we need to go back about 500 years. And we're back in Spain. And in Spain, the Catholics had their story. Muslims and Jews were bad. Christians are pure. Now, they actually take, took that and put it into a law, the purity of blood law. Christians had pure blood, the rest not. Now, picture Columbus going over to the Americas, taking his Spanish friends along, and now they're mixing with all the natives. And now, all of a sudden, the question comes up. Um, what are we going to do with all the inheritance, because we have all these mixed children? Well, they took the law of purity of blood, and they changed that. And they said, well, let's do it on the basis of skin color. 
16 different shades of skin color, skin color to be exact. Those who were darker got nothing. Those who were lighter got everything. Now, this story, of course, needed to be indoctrinated. The Europeans used this story to justify their force across the globe. They basically said, you are inferior because you're dark. We are superior because we're white. Now, religion was used and the Bible was opened up to show people that they were inferior. Next to that, science was used. People were, were actually exposed in human zoos. Not only that, re-education. People were ripped from their homes, from their families. From North America, the natives were taken from their homes and taken and put into residential schools just to show how inferior they were and how they needed to be different. All the way to the aboriginals in Australia where the same thing happened. Now this story went on and on and on. Even my own mother, when she saw innovative things, she said, and my mother, by the way, is part African and part Jewish. White people are smart, aren't they? And I still love you, mom. <laughs> I said, what? Who does not recognize these types of stories about white people being smarter or better or whatever? So I came to think about that story and I thought about Curacao. So I did an experiment last year. I took about 40 people, and I gave them a project. Can you please come up with a billboard to show a couple of things? Skin products, hair products, and clothing. Please just take these magazines and cut something out and make something nice. Here is the result. If you look very carefully, the dark-skinned Curacao people went into the magazines and took out all the white people. White, still in their mind, is beauty. Dark is not. These are dark-skinned people. They still believe they do not have control. Now, the question becomes, is it just focused on Curacao? Well, no. If you go to Nigeria, Nigeria, 77% of the women use skin-whitening products. The Philippines, 50% skin whitening products. India, 61%. I can go on and on. Now, not only that, the hair extension market is about $1 billion a year. Colored contact lenses, $1.4 billion a year. And again, I can go on and on. These are not things that people do out of beauty. These are things that people do to climb hierarchy where they believe they have no control, and they're basically just climbing up until they get control. So how does a society which is shaped by this story start to choose? Well, we choose the same way we behave. My son actually drew this. We choose either to approach opportunity or avoid threat. Now, let me come up with an example. This is a coin. Let's say heads I win, tails I lose. If I flip this five times and it falls on heads, I believe I have control. So will I take the gamble and do it for the sixth time? Oh yeah, I will, because I think I have control. So the next time, I believe the chances of me getting heads is higher. But the chances are always the same. It's always 50-50%, right? If I flip this five times and I'm constantly losing, will I take the gamble to do it the sixth time? No, because I believe I have no control, so I will not take the gamble. I will not choose to take risk. So I thought about this, and I came up with a theory called control probability theory. It basically says that depending on our perception of control is how we view opportunities. So I looked at some data across the globe and I looked at societies and how they were structured. And I said, well, let's see if we can structure society along how the story of color has shaped that society, from not colonized to colonized. And then I looked at how are the choices that people are making. And all of a sudden, what falls out is the choice patterns seem to go from those countries where they take opportunity and those countries where they don't take opportunity, where they avoid threat. 
It also seems that those societies which are the most colonized, where the story of color seems to shape the society, people don't collaborate. Well, you may now say, well, that's a relationship. It doesn't prove causality. So I came up with an experiment. Um, I took about 100 of my students and did an interesting experiment where I said, I told them a story. I said, intelligence determines if you're a manager or a worker. So they did this intelligence test. It was fake, by the way. But the managers thought they were the most intelligent, and the workers, they thought they were dumb. So I then asked them to make a couple of choices. The first choice was, I give you $100, and with $100, you now invest. And you win if you get, if you draw a yellow ball out of this jar. Now, if you don't take a yellow ball out of the jar, then you lose your investment. So then I asked them, can you please tell me how many yellow balls are in the jar? And the managers said 40%. The workers, who considered themselves dumb, 30%. They saw less opportunity. Then I said, well, let's see if I can see how, ma how money flows between them. So I paired the managers with some managers, and some managers with workers, and workers, the same thing. And I then gave everyone $100. Please share this money with your partner. What happened was that the managers shared most with the managers. They didn't like to share with the workers. The workers, they didn't share with anyone. <laughs> they didn't share with their fellow workers, and they didn't share with the managers. So not only were the managers pumping down on the workers, guess what? The workers were keeping themselves down. Now, I started to think about societies, black-on-black -black crime. People looking at each other's eyes and saying, I don't like you, I don't want to work with you. You're a threat to me, all because of their perception of their own control. All because in their mind, they think they can't. Now, how do you change those choices? Well, to understand choices, we need to understand the brain. The brain itself has two large areas which are important for choices. One is called the amygdala, and I'm going to call it the survivor. And the other one is the... Oh, sorry about that. The other one is the, um, the prefrontal cortex. I'm going to call it the regulator. The survivor is our oldest part of our brain. It's our fear center. It allows us to avoid threat. The prefrontal cortex evolved much later. It regulates the survivor from acting out of fear the entire time. Now, the moment that people believe they have control, the orientation starts to go towards the prefrontal cortex, approach opportunity, approach goals. The moment that someone proceeds not to have control, the brain orients itself towards the survivor. When the survivor gets activated, people start to become very sensitive. They look at the world from threat. So guess what? If you're living in a society where all the billboards are of white people drinking soft drinks, being happy, laughing, and you see no black people with curly hair, what do you think about yourself? You have no control. What happens to your survivor? It gets activated. How do you now perceive yourself and others? You start to look at the world as if it is a threat. You start to become aggressive to ensure the threat doesn't become worse. Everything now looks like a threat. You become angry. You start to look at people, and you want to kill them. Now, how do you change that orientation? How do you flip the orientation from the survivor back to the prefrontal cortex, to the regulator? Well, I can tell you all a five-step program. I won't do that. I believe change comes from changing the brain's architecture. Now, I believe neuroscience has come up with an answer. Neuroscience has proven that meditation activates areas in the prefrontal cortex 
which allow us to regulate the survivor. Now, you may think of meditation as being Asian and people looking around like this. That's a story. Meditation reorients the brain. It makes us a lot more calm. Now, that's science, but do I have other experiences? Well, I have my own experience. I grew up in Australia. I was discriminated against every single day of my youth. I was told I was too black, I was too this, I was too that. And soon I started to feel that self-esteem, that avoidance of threat. And I started to see if I could find myself more value. So I went into education and I tried to excel in education because that would give me value. And then when that didn't give me value, then I started to look towards career because maybe that could give me value. So I started to go from one story to the next and all of a sudden I'm in this career path and I become a managing director of a bank and I'm thinking, well, now do I have value? Because after so many years, I'm still trying to find it. And I look up at the heavens and I see no angels coming down, I feel no value. All I found was depression and anxiety. I, my, my feelings were not under my control. I was aggressive to my loved ones, to my friends. I had no control of my body. And I had one solution that somebody came up with. Try Vipassana meditation. After about four or five months, all of a sudden, things just calmed down. I was able to regulate, regulate my emotions that were so out of control. Not only that, it enabled me to see the stories. The stories that have been wrapped around people's minds, that we take our children, bring them to school, and tell them you need to be someone in the future, and you are someone because you do something. We then look at teachers grading our children to tell them they have a value or don't have a value. And then when they go into society, there's somebody else waiting on them with some kind of evaluation form saying, well, uh, I'm going to now evaluate you again. And we're constantly looking for value. And then all of a sudden, people are finding, well, where do I get value? So they start buying things to see if they can get value. Bigger cars, bigger this, bigger that. All to find value and then just hope that they can retire and live life. If there's one takeaway from this is the stories of capitalism are the same as the stories of colonialism. It basically says the same thing. You are inferior and you need to be someone else. Stories we use to predict our environment so we can control that environment, but others have made stories to control us. Learn to observe the stories for what they are. Don't identify with those stories. Soon you will be able to approach opportunity, smash the boxes, and realize one thing, that we have no value. That's a story. We have only one thing, unlimited potential. It's all right up here. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.